Okay, I think uh, we can um, can start because uh, well, we have a limited amount of time here. So, uh, welcome everybody to uh, this uh, special colloquium, which will be given by Professor Indara Suarez from uh, Boston uh, University. And uh, today, uh, uh, Professor Suarez is. Um, a member of uh, the CMS uh, collaboration currently. She was a student at uh, Texas A&M, where she was also an NSF graduate fellow. From there, she moved for her um, postdoctoral uh, work to uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, and she had uh, the presidential uh, postdoctoral fellowship at uh, UCSB. and. Uh, Again, she continued her work on the CMS experiment, and as she also moved to BU as an assistant professor three years ago. Professor Suarez has been, um, uh, physics is uh, um, mostly in the past concentrated between uh, SUSY and dark matter, and you will hear from her uh, also her future interests in long-lived particles. And as she puts it, it's uh, the perfect storm of uh, recent LHC results. But before I uh, give over the floor to her, I'd also like to say that Professor Suarez has held many uh, significant uh, leadership positions in both physics analysis and detector construction and operations at uh, the CMS experiment, uh, both in the muon detectors and now in the MIP timing detectors. And uh, uh, Professor Suarez is um, is uh, also applying machine learning techniques in finding, you know, understanding the quality of data and um, trying to uh, sort of uh, uh, classify data as good and bad, as well as in her analysis, she is applying uh, machine learning techniques as uh, well. So uh, she has been a recipient for quite a few awards as well. As recently, she got the DOE Early Career Award and. Uh, we congratulate her for that, and we are really uh, thrilled that she agreed to give us uh, this special colloquium. So um, we invite her to start her colloquium on the LHC results. Thank you. All right, thank you. So I'm going to uh, paste a few links into the chat, and later on I'm going to explain what these links are, um, but I leave them there in case they, I need to paste them again. Um, so this picture at the cover of my talk, uh, it was very fitting to my title. Um, I think that we are a very special moment at the LHC, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we've done so far and where we want to go. Um, so this picture is actually coming from the Sun newspaper, and, and the article is titled Another Dimension, Portals Are Opening. Uh, which I think it's really uh, exciting. It's, it's really uh, descriptive of like where my future is. Uh, when uh, where I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about that in the in uh, later on in the slides. Uh, but it's actually a pic. There's people that have a hobby of taking pictures um, on, on uh, of the nearby towns uh, close to the LHC. And the, the article is all about how they think like, you know, new dimensions are literally opening uh, because of our experiment. So it's entertaining. Uh, and I guess once I say, well, you can send those slides around since there's a lot of uh, links like this in the talk. Um, so first I wanna start uh, telling you a little bit about me and what got me excited about particle physics. Um, so um, when I first, moved to the US, I remember that um, I, there was all these like beautiful pictures of Hubble coming out and I remember seeing them on the cover of the LA Times. And what really attracted me to think about, you know, higher education and, and science was that, you know, these pictures were so pretty and, uh, you know, it was so exciting to see, um, you know, how far we were exploring our, our universe. Um, and of course, 31 years later, right, we have gone an immense amount of information from Hubble. Um, but what's really interesting to me now is that I look at these pictures and what interests me is actually not, you know, the beautiful colors that I can see, right, but it's the evidence for the invisible, for the things that I cannot see. Um, and of course, Hubble is just one of the, you know, many developments by astronomy and cosmologists um, that have allowed us to study in depth our universe and 
have given us, you know, sort of a definition of what we mean when we say we're out there looking for new physics, right? You'll hear this a lot from people at the LHC. We're looking for new physics. How do you define this new physics? It's actually very in tune with, with um, things that are going on in other areas of physics uh, that is not, you know, just collider. And so I think a pretty important uh, part of this story, of course, is um, the, the measurements that have been done um, for the velocity of stars in uh, spiral galaxies. Um, so the idea here is that you try to um, under, you know, you know from uh, Newton's law of gravitation, um, what this uh, velocity should, should act like as you're, you know, measuring stars farther and farther away from the center of this galaxy, right? Um, introductory physics tells you like this curve, as you move away from the center of the galaxy, this curve should go like one over the square root of the radius or, or the distance from the center of the galaxy of these stars. Um, of course, that's not precisely what we see. What we are able to measure, I hope you can see my mouth, is this uh, green curve here, whereas what we expect is this pink curve um, from, again, from Newton's law of gravitation. And what, um, what the difference between these two curves is, is actually the halo of invisible matter that is surrounding these galaxies. And why we're actually able to, to get these type of results, which by the way, were done by hand, I think by graduate students probably, right? Um, it, what, what, the, what was the really big breakthrough came, came from an instrument that Vera Rubin uh, designed, right? A sensitive spectrograph that could measure these um, velocity curves like to very high precision on the edge of the spiral galaxies. And thanks to that development and instrumentation, we're actually able to get our first, you know, big evidence of, of dark matter. And of course, like I said, there's been, you know, a lot, a lot of uh, different experiments, um, a lot of uh, ast astronomical and cosmological observations over there that basically tell us what our universe looks like. So what we think our universe looks like, you know, without knowing about all of this uh, astronomy and cosmology is this very, very, sorry, I keep losing my mouse. Uh, okay, I think I lost my mouse. Oh, um, I'm not sure if you can see it. Okay. I'm just gonna give up on it. Um, what we see, um, what what um, what what we think we understand of our universe is this very very small slice of it. That's you know the stars that we see around us, whatever's you know uh, in our planet and and so on. But there's a bigger chunk of our universe that we really don't understand. This is what we call dark matter, which actually composes 85% of all matter in in the universe and dark energy, which is 69% of the universe. And we really, um, you know, we, we have a lot of evidence that it's, that this is there, but we don't really understand like what it is, why it's there. Um, I think recently we're, you know, starting to understand how it, what role it plays into the, um, in, in our universe. Um, and I would even argue that this little chunk that we think we know well, we, um, it turns out that we still have a lot to learn about it. And so the way that we approach all of this is um, we have a theoretical model that is meant to describe all of the physics in the universe. And this is what we call the standard model. And so the standard model is how we study, um, you know, how we model like particle physics. And what it does is it describes 12 fundamental particles and how these 12 fundamental particles interact with each other through force carriers. And it, it's able to explain um, interactions of the electromagnetic strong and weak forces. Of course, I'm not mentioning gravity here, right? So that should already be a clue that something is missing. Um, what's beautiful about the standard model is that it has consistently been confirmed to very, very high precision with experimental measurements. So that's why we as particle physicists, um, you know, consider the standard model our, our sort of um, our, our way of describing particle um, particle interactions. And so the next thing you'll hear from from uh, from uh, particle physicists is that you know the Higgs boson is the last missing piece of the standard model. 
And th this is true, you know, the standard model, the way that it was formulated at first, it needed to have a mechanism for the particles to acquire mass, because of course, when we observe the W and the C boson, uh, we saw that they were very, very massive particles. And so the way the standard model was um, was formulated at first did not have mass for these, for these particles. And so the Higgs mechanism was introduced and it's, in, it's, it's important to remember that the Higgs mechanism is one way that these particles can acquire mass, right? When before the discovery, we really, that was the most popular uh, thing that um, theory, but we really didn't know. Um, but even just thinking about, you know, the requirement that these particles have to acquire mass, either through Higgs mechanism or not, indicated to us that understanding physics at the TeV scale was going to be very, very important. And so what we, what, what the Higgs mechanism introduces is a new particle, and it, we sort of knew that it was going to be a spin. Well, we knew that it was going to be a spin zero particle but we didn't really know the mass of this particle and it, it took quite a bit to, to um, you know, to, to find it, right? We searched for the Higgs for more than 40 years. Um, and we knew that the standard model particles acquire their mass by interacting with this uh, Higgs field. And so we built the LHC to study physics at the TV scale. And the questions that we were asking ourselves when we, when we were you know, designing the LHC and building it is, is the Higgs mechanism really um, the way that particles obtain their mass? If you do have a Higgs boson, is it just one Higgs boson? Is it the Higgs boson that the standard model tells you it should be? Um, or you know, do you have many Higgs bosons? Or is it you know, a supersymmetric Higgs boson? And if it's not a Higgs boson, what other solutions um, you know, to, to this mass problem um, can, can we explore at the LHC? And again, all of this points to new interactions and new particles at the TV scale. And so in 2012, uh, CMS and ATLAS, um, which are actually, I should have shown you, are um, two experiments on the opposite sides of, on the opposite side of the uh, LHC ring. Um, CMS and ATLAS were able to collect enough data to declare the discovery of a particle at 125 GeV that could be the, Higgs, the standard model Higgs boson. Um, this happened on July 4, 2012. I think many of us uh, remember uh, very vividly uh, that moment. Um, it was a very, very exciting moment. Um, but I think that, and, and since then, what we have done is try to study you know, this new particle, how it's produced, how it decays. And we've been able to study this um, you know, to 10% precision, which is really, really amazing. Of course, um, this new particle looks is very standard model like. So so far, it is you know what what we had expected it to be, um, which you know could be a little bit uh, disappointing because you, you know if you're looking for new physics and everything just continues to go along with a standard model, then you ask yourself you know like what is next? Is this standard model really the full picture of my universe? Um, of course, I already told you about dark matter and dark energy at the beginning, right? So we have to go back and remember that we still have this thing called dark matter that we don't understand anything about. And now another experiment, the cosmic microwave background tells us that dark matter interacts very, very weakly with ordinary matter. And that 85% of all our universe is, um, is, is uh, all the matter in our universe is dark matter. And this is now to show you the evolution of the type of experiments, right? Like the rotational curves were done by hand. Um, this is a super detailed map of our universe, right? So the type of technology that we have to develop to, to complete this, this measurement is just completely um, you know, different. Um, so if 85% of all matter in our universe is dark matter, this is consistent with what you would expect if dark matter was made up of weakly interactive massive particles. And these massive particles would be around the TV scale or you know, the electroweak energy scale. Um, so we, we can try to ask ourselves now, is the, the, dark, the, the standard model include a candidate for these weakly interactive massive particles or WIMPs? And so our standard model is full of diversity. It's, uh, you know, it has many different particles. All of these particles play a role. 
Um, so now I will ask you to go to the first link. Um, and in the first link, I have a little quick questionnaire uh, that will tell you what kind of standard model particle you are. And later on in the talk, I'm going to ask you to quickly fill in uh, your answer into the second link. Um, and at the end of the talk, I will show you the, the, uh, the results. And so um, if I ask myself, you know, does the standard model include, um, include a WIM candidate? I have to think about what I need WIMPs to be like in order to explain dark matter. They need to be neutral and stable. So that gets rid of a ton of my particles here. Um, they need to be weakly interactive. So that gets rid of the uh, photon and the gluon. And then they have to be very massive, which gets rid of my neutrinos because they have tiny masses. And so what I can say from this is that the standard model at very best may only be able to describe 15% of the matter in the universe. And so this is, you know, Again, this means that you, for those students in the audience, there are so many open questions uh, for you to, you know, do your PhD thesis on, or you know, go on to discover. So there's things. So many, all of these questions that I have listed here, you know, why we uh, we um, have the neutrino masses, you know, the way they are. Um, how are neutrinos fundamentally different than other particles? Like, what about how does gravity fit into all of this? What about the matter antimatter asymmetry in the universe? There's all of these questions that I'm not going to talk about today um, that are out there for you to really, you know, go explore. And so, for me, what what um, what has been the most, you know, interesting questions is trying to understand dark matter. And then also trying to understand this Higgs boson, because even the existence of the Higgs boson points to a problem in our standard model, or maybe not a problem, but an inconsistency. I think that uh, we can agree to, to call it that. So if this standard model is able to describe everything except for the gravitational force, then it should be uh, valid up to the Planck scale where gravity starts to you know, matter. And so if, if that's true, um, then, and we put in all of the mass terms of the Higgs boson, for the model to work out correctly, we would need to introduce 10 to the 32 uh, corrections uh, in, into the theory. And so, you know, when you say my theory is a factor of 10 wrong, you know, then you're like, okay, fine, you know. But if it's a factor of 10 to the 32, then, you know, that, that tends to be a little bit uh, more alarming. And just to describe how alarming that is, I've been spending a lot of time with my godchildren. Uh, who are very little. And so I think this is a good example, right? If you leave them alone in a room with a vase uh, that is like right on the edge of the table and you leave for two hours and you come back, you're either gonna have the, you know, the vase be at, uh, sorry, if the vase is on the table, you're either gonna have it like at the table where you left it or it's gonna be on the floor, right? Cause either they didn't see it, didn't pay attention to it, didn't disturb it or they just, you know, dropped it. Uh, what is very unnatural is that you come back and they put, they balance this vase right at the edge of the table. And so that's sort of the way that we think about, you know, these corrections, like they, there has to be some explanation behind it. And so the idea here now is that if I have to explain what these corrections are, right, I'm going to pretend I'm a theorist now. Um, and what I want to say is, okay, how do these corrections come about, or how does the Higgs boson mass come about in the in the standard model? Well, I know that it the biggest contribution to the Higgs boson is coming from the top quark blue, and so if I want to if I want to cancel those uh, those contributions, what I do is I add a new loop, and by adding a new loop, I'm introducing a new particle. And by requiring that that new loop cancels out the top quark um, contribution to the Higgs boson mass, then I already know some properties about that new particle. I know that the mass has to be more or less the same, and I know that the spin um, has to the spin difference between the two particles has to be a, a half. And so that's basically what supersymmetry is. And in that sense, it's really beautiful, right? Because you just create a whole new 
uh, a whole new family of particles um, that have similar masses to the standard model and have a spin difference of one half. So knowing these properties already tells you a little bit about you know, what you need to look for um, in an experiment. And what's even better about you know, supersymmetry is that it takes care of this hierarchy problem, um, you know, this understanding the Higgs mass. Uh, but it also has connections to dark matter because it has um, for it has a, a dark matter candidate, uh, which we call the LSP, the lightest supersymmetric particle, uh, which is a mix of eigenstates um, that are um, that are the supersymmetric partners of the gauge bosons. Um, so if I now think about, you know, what, how do I go about and look for these new particles um, at the LHC? I can uh, put, you know, I like baking, so I can put together a little recipe for how to do that. Um, so, and actually this is a cute picture that uh, my friend uh, Katie Grimm uh, put, uh, ha she has a, a website of physics cakes and uh, she makes all kinds of physics theme baked goods, um, and which was really fun because we used to live together and used to eat a lot of them. Um, so this is one of them, uh, one of the ones she made. I think the top is the angel cake and the stop is like a, a very dense cake. Um, so it's, you know, you can go on the website. It's a lot of fun. Um, Anyway, so the ingredients to look for these new particles at the LHC um, are first, you need to have a good accelerator. So we have the LHC, which is amazing and has been amazing to us uh, for all its existence. Um, and then we, you have to have good detectors. Um, so I work on CMS. Of course, there's another detector called ATLAS as well. Um, and uh, you have to have a good trigger. So a good way to make a decision of whether or not you store the data that's coming from the LHC collisions. And this decision is really important because if you don't store the data, then it's like, it didn't happen, right? Whatever you, you, you didn't store is, you could be missing on a lot, of, um, a, lot, on a lot of new physics there. So you have to be very careful with the trigger. And then you have to do a bunch of uh, different searches. And these searches, you need to make sure that you're, you're able to not just say, OK, this is, uh, I'm going to search for supersymmetry. And so I'm going to do you know, these type of, uh, I'm going to look at these type of events. You need to make sure that what you search for is um, comprehensive and, and both generic and specific so that you don't miss any uh, clues of new physics. Um, and then finally, whenever you're trying to isolate um, these signals from, from new particles, you need to really, really understand your detector and your physics backgrounds. And so you will need you know, a lot of tools, uh, detector materials. Uh, I put fancy magnets, right? CMS has a really great magnet. Electronics, software, and computing, those are the tools that you learn through the process of you know, going through this recipe. And I also put, when in doubt, consult your local theorists. I actually enjoy talking to theorists quite a bit um, because it's, it's always a lot of fun. Um, but it also gives you this idea of the bigger you know, physics picture. And so post Higgs discovery, a lot of us, uh, you know, what we did is, and, and we're doing it again right now, was focused on, um, on, on, um, on the detector and the trigger side. And so the idea was that we were waiting for this so-called LHC run two, uh, where we were gonna get more data than we had uh, during run one, which is what the data that we used for the Higgs discovery. And we were also gonna get higher collision energy. And so this was really great for searching for supersymmetric particles because when you go to higher uh, collision energy, then you get a large increase in the cross sections of these particles or the rate at which they are produced. Um, whereas your backgrounds that are standard model particles, um, the, their cross section is only increasing by a factor of two or three. And so this helped you a lot with the challenges behind all of these analysis. And 
now that you had a good detector, you had to make sure, uh, sorry, a good accelerator, right, with the LHC, you had to make sure that your detectors were going to be able to perform very well under these new accelerator conditions. And so at the at, during run one, we had this top picture here where you just see, um, sorry, top right picture, uh, where you just see that you have the collision and then just a few particles are, are flying out of that collision. And for run two, you, the, the particles that were going to be flying out of the collision were going to increase severely. So you had about you know, 50 events that uh, were happening uh, per, per, um, per beam crossing. And so you have to make sure that your, your detectors are able to handle the radiation and that you're able to maintain all the full you know, great performance as before. And so Atlas and CMS underway very, very large uh, upgrades during the long, what we call the long shutdown one. I work on uh, the CMS upgrade, so I'll talk to you a little bit about the CMS detector. You can think of it as a giant onion. And each part of this onion is a specific detector technology um, that helps you in, in the end reconstruct all of the particles that are flying out. And so at the very, um, I think the easiest ones to understand are the muons because muons just go through, you know, all kinds of material without interacting. And so at the very end of the detector, you have the muons. Um, and if I want to know if something is a muon, muons are charged particles. So I look for a track in the, in the tracker, which is right at the middle of the detector. And I look for a hit in the muon chambers, which is at the outside of the detector. Um, and so I can, you know, play different, uh, di different uh, I can put together different com combinations of energy deposits from different particles. And then that way I can classify each of my particle into, you know, electron, muon, um, and so on. Um, now there's particles like neutrinos that are just gonna fly through the detector and they're not gonna leave any sign, right? And so to be able to detect these invisible particles, I'm gonna use something called missing transverse energy. And this ends up being a very, very important uh, component of, of our uh, particle categorization because other particles that also do not interact with detectors are dark matter particles. Um, so what we do is, again, we go back to our basic, basic physics and we do, you know, conservation of momentum, right? Um, and by uh, doing conservation of momentum, then we are able to uh, put, to, put together all of the energy that is uh, from the visible particles and then balance it out with the energy that's uh, from invisible particles. And so this, this ends up being a very, very, um, uh, uh, sorry, I should say, this is what we call uh, missing transverse energy, right? Because we can do this only in the um, transverse plane. Um, so this missing transverse energy or MET is actually a really, really good way that we go look for SUSI and dark matter particles. Because remember these WIMPs um, or these heavy uh, dark matter particles, they're not interacting with the detector. And these SUSI particles are you know, really, really uh, heavy. And so you are gonna ex expect very large uh, missing transverse energy. And this is, you know, you could have, I think the first time the LHC turned on, they saw something like this, where in the yellow you had what you expected from simulation. And here you have the data points, what the data showed you. And um, you see here that there's a big tail in the missing uh, transverse energy spectrum on the data and not in the simulation, right? So this could potentially be a sign of new physics. Um, this is exactly what we're looking for. However, you know, before we call the mariachis for the party, uh, we have to make sure that this sign of new physics is actually new physics and not something that we did not understand with, with the detectors. And so it turns out that there's things that happen in our detectors that can mimic this, um, this uh, missing transverse energy. Like if you have some particle and you mismeasure their, um, their momentum, then you will have you know, some missing transverse energy, right? Your equation will not work out 
quite the way you expect. So it's, I think this is why it's really, it's one of the reasons uh, why it's so important for students to not just do analysis, but actually get their hands dirty and, you know, really spend some time doing some um, detector physics work. And so after you take, after you, you um, get rid of all of the detector effects, uh, you see from this plot that, you know, that tail now becomes these black dots that match exactly with um, with the expectation from simulation. So you have to be very, very careful with your detectors because they can definitely uh, mimic a new physics signature. And so what I was working mainly on uh, during this time was um, the upgrade of the um, muon detectors. Um, and the idea here was that we, we were running into trouble with the trigger. Um, the, the muon triggers, uh, the thresholds were very big and they were gonna affect um, our physics program. Um, and so what we did is we upgraded, we did a electronics upgrade uh, to be able to make sure that we can continue having these low PT thresholds for muons and also had good reconstruction. Um, and this helped us, of course, not just search for new physics, but also continue our study of the properties of the Higgs boson. Um, and muons are, you know, they're, they're important enough that they're like our middle name in CMS, right? Compact muon solenoid. So we, we really put a lot of effort to make sure that we were gonna get, you know, a clean uh, muon final states for our analysis. And so what I personally worked on um, was this little, uh, little part of the detector, right? It's, it's a very small nose of it, but it's very important. Um, and what I worked on was the so-called ME11 upgrade. These ME11s are um, cathode strip chambers. And so what happens is you, you have a muon coming in, there, these ch chambers are full of gas, and you have six layers of cathode um, of cathode wires and anode strips. Um, and so as the muon goes in, you're actually able to um, get a timing readout for, for the muon as well as a PT measurement of, for the muon. Um, and, and so the, these, these um, major electronics upgrade meant that we had to uh, upgrade all, like, all the electronics that were on the chambers of the muons. Um, including actually reconfiguring some of, of some of those chambers. And then also the electronics that were um, on the peripheral crates that took care of you know, the trigger and the data uh, acquisition, whether or not we actually store the data that these muons were seeing. And that required us to, you know, to equip all, our, all of our chambers with new FPGAs because we needed to be able to handle these um, increased uh, data and trigger rates, right? In that little part of, of the detector where we are, that's when you get the most uh, the most data rates, and so it was really important that we did this upgrade. Otherwise, those detectors would it you know might as well not have been there. Um, and so we did a lot of FPGA uh, upgrades um, of the technologies, and also like included optical uh, transceivers, which. You know, by now, when we're thinking about the high luminosity LHC, this is basically what all of the new upgrades are doing. Um, and this upgrade, you know, I, I will say was a really special moment in my time. It was a, a big part of me being a graduate student. Um, and I was able to participate in many, many parts of this upgrade, and I learned a lot about electronics. Um, so this upgrade took, uh, this is just from the moment that I moved to CERN, before that we were designing the, the boards that I just showed you in the previous slide. Um, but, you know, throughout these two, two years and more than 20 students uh, and postdocs from, and, and scientists from different institutes, plus the help of many engineers, uh, we went from um, testing all of the new electronics equipping the new chamber, the chambers with all the new electronics and installing them in the cavern, commissioning them and seeing the first muons from cosmic rays. Um, you know, that was, that was um, a lot of work that uh, a lot of us uh, put together, but it was a really special moment because I think that um, we as students and, and the postdocs ended up learning a lot from this experience. Um, so after this upgrade, now that I have, you know, LHC started, run two started, I have to think about like, what kind of searches am I going to do? And, and what do I need to understand about backgrounds, right? So as I said already, we want to cover a wide range of new physics signatures. 
Um, we want to understand backgrounds and how we estimate them, right? Because we know our simulation is not perfect. And when these searches, what's really important is that you use as many tools as you can. And that's tools from um, using kinematic endpoints, right? Things that make sense physics wise, um, as well as using some of these new machine learning tools uh, to reduce backgrounds. And when you talk about, you know, about these tools, uh, this is again, where talking to a local theorist helps a lot because theorists actually develop quite a bit of uh, phenomenological um, uh, variables that can help you uh, preserve signal and discriminate against background. And so what I started to do when I became a postdoc was I said, I want to search for stops because I want to understand the Higgs mass. I want to understand dark matter. And this is a you know, perfect project to, to do it. Um, and so I, I must say that I was uh, not a SUSE enthusiast and I had never worked on SUSE before. So this was all new to me. Um, and the way we go for searching for stops is we ask ourselves, you know, how do these stops get produced and what do they decay into? And we, we consider two general um, decay modes for these stops. One of them where they decay into a top and a neutralino or the um, dark matter candidate. And the other one where they decay into a B and a charchino um, and that charchino then decays into a W and a neutralino. So regardless of how these stops are decaying, I have the same final state of a B quark, a W boson, and then this dark matter candidate, which is gonna be um, invisible to my detector, right? And, and so what allows me to probe for this, um, you know, for, for, and I look for per production because then I'm able to um, probe for uh, our parity conserving uh, SUSE. And so what that looks like in my experiment is two BTAC jets, two W bosons, and then a ton of missing transverse energy coming mainly from the, um, from the dark matter candidate, but also from, you know, some of the neutrinos um, once the WCK. Um, so then you looked, you, then you have to look at the previous results, right? What did we learn from run one about stops? And we usually publish a lot of these uh, so-called limit plots. And so this is the results from run one. On the x-axis, you have the mass of the, of the top quark and on the y-axis, you have the mass of the dark matter candidate. And as you can see from the run one results, there was plenty of room to move, right? We, we could look at higher masses. There's some gaps in this, um, in, in this, um, in these exclusions. So basically anything that's below the red line is what we excluded, where we say, you know, stops cannot be. Um, so when you start mapping out your, your search, you say, I want to look everywhere that I possibly can with my detector and, and, and the LHC energy that I have. And so we went after the larger stop masses, the larger uh, dark matter uh, candidate masses, and we went after these gaps on where you have very, very special spectrum, uh, where the mass of the of the stop is almost uh, it, it's, it's very close to the mass of the top and the mass of the dark matter candidate. And so this is the top corridor and in similarity, you have something called the W corridor. And then we also looked at other uh, compressed spectrum. The thing with compressed spectrum is that, you know, you tend to have very, very soft um, decay, it's a very, very soft decay product. So it makes it more difficult for you to trigger, to reconstruct and so on. And so the, the, how we map this search is first we look at the physics variables that we can use to discriminate against the background and preserve the signal. And so for this one lepton search um, that, that we did where one of the uh, Ws that I have in my final state decays to one lepton, um, and it, for here, the, what a really good um, variable for this is the transverse mass. And so for the background, the transverse mass uh, is mostly concentrated in the low end because transverse mass is, a, um, is, is dependent on the missing transverse energy. And there, the missing transverse energy is only coming from the neutrinos. Uh, for the signal, it's, it's morally, mostly fat and you get a big tail at the end, right? So naively you say, well, I cut around the mass of the W and that should get rid of all my background and this analysis should be super easy, right? 
Of course, our detector does not work that way, right? It always comes with surprises, and there's, there's reasons why you end up getting a ton of background even in that tail. Um, and, and what the challenge there is, is that this background in the tail is coming from events where you have top port per production and you don't detect one of the leptons that uh, one of those legs decays on. And so then you end up having a lot of missing transverse energy. So then you talk to a theorist, right? You call your friends and you say, hey, do you have any good variables for me? Um, and sometimes they do, right? And this is why you should talk to them. Um, when we did this, this, uh, this, exp this analysis, when we started this in 2016, there was a very popular variable called topness. And we, we did not talk to the theorists, right? I did not follow my own advice. Um, and we started playing with this variable because you know, the, the, the phenomenological papers showed you know, that there was uh, good performance, but we were not seeing that when we were applying it to our search. And it turns out that there's some terms in this uh, equation for topness that are very sensitive to energy resolution effects. And so if we just get rid of those, this variable is very powerful. And so we, we, we modify the variable. We, in our paper, we call this modified topness um, to only in, to exclude those uh, components where, you're, um, where you have these resolution effects. And it, it's what we use as one of the basic variables in our search. Um, then the last thing we did is as we went, uh, you know, finished collecting all of the round two data, um, we decided that we, we wanted to, you know, apply machine learning techniques uh, because we knew that being able to identify hadronically decaying top was going to uh, kill a ton of our background. And so what we did is we uh, applied deep neural networks to identify these um, hadronically decaying tops and you can have you know, tops that are decaying into very, three very specific jets, or you can have one that has, you know, a high, P, uh, high, high PT and is going to just look like a fat jet. And so this allowed us to actually go after regions uh, where we had very, very large background and push the limits of the high mass, but also push uh, of the high stop mass, but also push the limits um, of the high uh, dark matter mass. And um, you know, before run two, what we thought, you know, SUSI, natural SUSI was gonna look like is, you know, the theorists told us the stops should be around one TV, you will have very light uh, Higgs signals and your gluino should not be too heavy. And what we have seen now is that our stop searches, you know, go beyond this one TV uh, limit. And this is both for Atlas and CMS searches. We've done, you know, many, many analysis. Um, and that these uh, gluinos are also, you know, going to, to very, are being excluded at high limits and we don't yet have evidence for like Higgsinos. And so we have to sort of ask ourselves, you know, now what, like, what do we do about SUSI, right? Um, so I think it's important to think of why we went into SUSI to begin with, right? It, it was a very rich, uh, a framework with very rich phenomenology. Um, you know, and th the interpretations that we do, all these plots that I've shown you and these limits, they're always subject to what models we choose. And the models that we have chosen for these initial results are simplified models. There's still many other places to look. Um, so, you know, one other thing that, that, we, that my group uh, did recently was actually look for evidence of new electroweakly produced particles or so the so-called electroweakinos, right? If these stops are too heavy, it could be that these electroweakinos are light enough to see at the LHC. And again, we play the same tricks. We look at uh, different phenomenological variables. We also looked at machine learning um, uh, tools to identify Higgs decay into a pair of B quarks. Um, and we were able to severely um, you know, push our limits yet again. Um, in 2016, we had this black curve here that you see, and you see that we went from about 540 GeV to uh, around uh, 800 GeV in our, in our res new result. And again, we're able to push all of this, not just because we're getting more data, um, but because that more data is allowing us to use more sophisticated um, tools. And then beyond SUSI, you know, as I said, when you want to do, uh, when when you want to look at um, 
at, at the, when you want to do these searches, you don't just think about like my model that is my favorite, right? You think, okay, what else are these final states sensitive to? And so another thing we did for the stop searches was actually reinterpret them in the TT plus dark matter uh, models where we are able to once uh, to again push the, the limits very high and exclude um, mediator particle masses up to 420 GeV. And so this is all in our um, paper that should be coming out um, to the public pretty well. The results are public, but the paper will be published soon. Um, and so now I ask you to go back to the little questionnaire and uh, fill out, and this is the second link I sent you, fill out what the particle mass, uh, what, what particle you are, and then I will continue on my talk. So now we ask ourselves, is supersymmetry dead, right? And I will argue that supersymmetry is immortal because it, it really depends on how you think about naturalness, right? What is the, the level of naturalness that you, are, uh, that you are comfortable with, right? And I think that if you're being an optimist, you know, when the theorist said like stop should be around one TV, you know, that's not, doesn't mean exactly one TV, right? That's that you have to sort of go where the data tells you. Um, and, and so, you know, it's a moment where you have like a soul search and ask yourself. Um, I think that regardless of, of what you decide, it's supersymmetry is still a very nice framework that easily stands the, the standard model and includes new particles that we can still look for. And there's still a lot of face space that is not, you know, covered in that. Um, I had a very cute exchange with uh, Carlos Wagner, who is a big SUSE enthusiast. Um, I made a Day of the Dead altar um, and, and I uh, put a supersymmetry book for my friend Tristan um, because I thought it was more exciting than the, you know, no supersymmetry uh, results. And so uh, Carlos commented that, you know, the, it, am I considering supersymmetry dead? Anyway, that, um, that, that was not what I meant, but... <laughs> Uh, it was still a lot of fun. So I will say that supersymmetry is on life support right now. And I think that the important takeaway from run two is that we have excluded a, a lot of these uh, prevailing motions of dark matter and naturalness at the collider, right? These simplified models, um, we know that that's not the way uh, nature works. And so you have to you know, look at the full run two data results from CMS and ATLAS and ask yourself like, okay, where do I go next, right? And realize that we've only collected 3% of the LHC data. And so, you know, when, when you think about where we go next, there's a big area to go next. And I think uh, what's really gonna be interesting is understanding the uh, production and decay modes of, you know, the, the, the beyond standard model production and decay modes of the Higgs boson, how it interacts with the, you know, dark sector. And with more data, we're going to be able to go after more challenging signatures of new physics, like long-lived particles, more Higgs measurements, that if they deviate, they could point to a new physics. But what this means is that we have to go back to the kitchen. We have to go back and, you know, again, there's going to be changes in the accelerator. A lot of us are working on detector uh, upgrades right now. Um, you know, we need to rethink how we do the trigger even before we get those detector upgrades. How we do the analysis, we have a lot of um, new AI developments. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're also getting into places where, you know, we think we understand standard model backgrounds, but there could still be more to learn from that. And so the hopeful future of the LHC, right? I always move this forward. Um, the hopeful future of the LHC is that during run three, hopefully we'll start seeing some new, you know, excesses, maybe small, you know, two sigmas or something like this. And that at the high luminosity LHC, after we do all of our phase two detector upgrades, we'll be able to, um, you know, to see some of these uh, evidence for uh, wind particles or like new, you know, new type of forces or new type of, or, or other type of particles that we haven't thought of. And of course, this is all gonna come from measurements of, you know, Higgs couplings uh, gonna come from a lot of standard model measurements and a lot of searches that are pushing our detectors and are requiring new detector technologies. And so because of this, you know, as we prefer for high luminosity LHC, my group is working, uh, continuing their work at Muon Detectors, 
but also um, putting together a brand new detector that's going to give us um, 40 picosecond uh, timing resolution. And the, the impact of this new detector is going to be equivalent uh, to us if we collected 20% extra data. Uh, we also have you know, new, uh, new uh, tools. Um, a new tool that I've been working on a lot is, uh, which I'm really excited about, is, um, is uh, monitoring this detector data and searching for anomalies. And we do this to operate the detector, um, but there's also a lot of ideas of how we can use these type of tools and these type of AI technologies to find new physics in, uh, of new, like a new physics that we hadn't even thought about. And I think what's more important is that in all of this, we need students. Like we need undergraduate students to be involved in hardware and physics analysis projects. And my group has a lot of undergraduate students and I am always uh, you know, uh, taking more. <laughs> Um, and then we need graduate students because graduate students actually do quite a bit of the work. And I think it's, it's especially important for graduate students to get involved because, you know, after graduate school, you know, you may decide not to go into academia. You may go and start a whole new field, right? We've seen a lot of this happening um, in particle physics, a lot of, the, you know, the, the um, cancer fields and a lot of the uh, data science fields, um, those are now being um, places where particle physicists uh, go and in, in, in fields that fundamental physics and fundamental research have, um, you know, have, have, um, that have emerged from, from, from that. And so, you know, I have many, many students always working on detectors. I send them to CERN as much as I can uh, when it's possible. Uh, usually when we're at CERN, I take them hiking. Um, and you know we have a really great time working on detectors, and um, I, I also make sure that they are you know learning a lot and, and publishing a lot. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Any questions? I see Chris has a lot of questions. Oh, and I guess as maybe as people ask questions, I can exit for a second and, and paste the results of our little survey. Um, I cannot hear anyone. Uh, can you guys hear me? Can anyone hear? Yes, me? Uh, we can hear you. We okay. see your email if that's what you. <laughs> oh, that's not what I want to show you. Okay, so yeah. let me stop share. Okay, there you go. I was uh, going to pull up the question there, but maybe I could take some questions while I do that. Yeah. So um, first of all, thank you for a very nice talk and. Uh, and if you have any questions, please raise your hand and I'll call them in sequence. Okay, there are um, currently, oh, there is Greg who has a question for you. Okay. Yes, uh, hi Dara, thanks a lot uh, for the talk again. Um, it's more of a comment rather than a question. When you say Susie is in life support, I'm sure a lot of people who work on Susie and I here might be a little bit uh, upset about this statement. And I, I think a more fair statement would be that the low energy Susie, which we could discover at the colliders, is in life support. Where of course, Susie could be at the gut scale, and uh, that is something which is totally theoretically possible. And uh, unfortunately, we cannot really tell much about such scenario. Yeah, I, I mean, you're right. It, it, I guess what I mean is SUSI is in life support to the point where we can test it at the LHC, right? Um, of course, it, it, and again, it depends a lot on what you're, uh, you know, I, I know how comfortable are you walking away from naturalness? And I think that for a lot of us that uh, naturalness now has a different meaning, right? Um, I, I think at the beginning of round two and a lot of the motivation for these searches uh, was really, you know, trying to, to test naturalness. Um, but now, I mean, the, the theories are evolving to a point that that, you know, precise naturalness is not a, like, it's not a must anymore for us, right? 
Uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, just... it's, it's a moving target, right? Because uh, indeed, uh, first we thought Susie particle should be below the Z mass, then you know radiative corrections became large and right. they're higher. But uh, even now, you know, if you talk to theorists who want to defend naturals, they would say that LHC could only test naturals to about five percent, and need FCC to completely test it. So it's a bit of uh, in the eye of the beholder what you call natural or not. Uh, I mean, I agree with you that- uh, I mean, I also uh, said that Susie is are... immortal, right? And yeah. it's immortal precisely because of this. And it's also immortal because it provides you with so many great signatures. So, you know, it's it's uh, it's a uh, love-hate the relationship. The great sandbox for theorists and for experimentalists too, so yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thanks. Yeah, uh -huh, of course. Sorry, I just realized the the little questionnaire was not working, so I just installed uh, started it again. So if you can fill it out, I've been collecting these actually. Uh, so Jay, maybe. I I cannot hear you. I think. Sorry, I just unmute yeah. myself. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks. I'm not even sure I was the first raising my hand, but I appreciate being caught. So let me just uh, uh, take the advantage of asking this um, for not being a a high energy physicist. Um, mm -hmm. I've been um, to a lot of talks that I, you know, couldn't understand. I think they were almost by design because people didn't give background. Finally, in your talk, I actually understood a lot more than some of the other talks. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And of course, the danger of making your talk um, understandable to uh, outsiders is people will raise questions, right? Um, mm -hmm even seemingly naive to people in your field. So this one particular plot that, plot that you show, it's almost like this uh, you know, triangular shaped counter plot. And that's the region, I guess, if there's a particle in that mass region, you would have discovered, right? So that, that's the um, uh, The one we see, I, yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, so uh, did it make it understandable to other people? Yes. In this region, we should right. have um, we, we should have uh, seen some evidence, right? Because right. we asked for Phi Sigma to discover. Right, so that's the you know, from the first run, the second run, so that triangle gets a lot bigger, right? Yeah, so this so, is early run, this is actually from early run two. We only use a little chunk of the data. And yeah. then this green line here corresponds to here, uh, which is um, where we use all of the data and all of our uh, updates. And yes. the and, difference and, is, and, it, if we would have just repeated what we did at the beginning of round two, it would be at this red line. So this big difference is actually coming from new tools. Yes, I understand. I mean, this is one thing many areas of science have in common is mm -hmm. getting, you know, acquiring more data, acquire, you know, data with better resolution or, you know, it, with more clarity. Mm -hmm. But uh, by the end of the day, if I understood correctly, right? Now, besides the discovery of Higgs, right? That was a crown achievement a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So they are not, am I right? Am I too naive to say there are not so many particles that have been discovered yet? Is that what you mean by Susie on life support? I just Yeah, want. yeah, we have not discovered um, particles on the TV scale. So, you. yeah, you're right. Um, but I, I also argue that, well, you know, the Higgs was a big achievement. It also comes with a lot of questions. And so that's sort of the exciting part of it. And trying to understand how you connect those questions with science of new physics, you know, with dark matter, with these other questions that we have, um, you know, and, and utilizing this Higgs, especially this analysis, we're using the Higgs for new physics. And that's, you know, that, that's been really, um, I think that's the future of, of what we do in, in LHC physics. Great, thanks. I appreciate that kind of that clarity to people outside, you know, what's been seen, what's, you know, what other things, what you guys are chasing after. Thank you. All right, uh, maybe Jim? I guess Jim Gates. Yes, I, yeah, thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm getting unmuted and, and putting on my audio. First of all, Indar, I wanna thank you for a very, very clear presentation. As Jay said, a lot of talks you go to and their words and they fly fast and you can't nail them down. This was certainly the, uh, the exact opposite. Uh, so I, I, Minakshi knows this and maybe, maybe Greg does too. Not all of us were ever taken with the idea that uh, supersymmetry was going to be found uh, very easily by the LHC 
And in fact, uh, as I said, I, I published, going back to 2006, I've been on the record as saying I am extraordinarily skeptical about the idea that uh, the naturalness arguments would run the day. So uh, let's see, someone had commented that some of us might be uncomfortable with the idea of Susie on life support. Well, some of us aren't uncomfortable because we always thought that the, that the, predominant, uh, the predominant beliefs were just not going to hold up. And now they haven't held up. So what do we do? But well, we do what physicists always do, exactly what you're doing, Indara, and I want to compliment you for it. You keep applying the highest level of technical competence and imagination and mathematics and raw hard work, and you keep looking. And that's what I've always thought. Uh, uh, Minakshi knows I'm a fan for uh, multi-TEV scale, Susie, and so that's a little bit still beyond the reach uh, for a while. But I truly do think that's the future. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a big fan of yours and not at all uncomfortable with the death of uh, the minimal supersymmetric model, which is essentially what seems to be happening now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I, I will say, I think that this is very powerful because it, it, it really, you know, it, it, the LHC has been special in a way that we're getting all of this data and these results are really a way that we communicate between experimentalists and theorists, right? And, and getting to this point, even if we did not find a, a particle, um, it's just generating that future in particle physics. Um, so it's because it, you know, it, it sometimes does look a little depressing, right? Like we did not, we haven't found anything since the Higgs. Um, but I think that, you know, if it, you have to sort of love the process of doing the science. Um, and then in that process, you learn a lot, um, you know, about, about even standard model physics that, um, that can help you um, figure out the path towards, you know, what this new physics is going to look like. Um, Ulrich, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for, for the talk. And uh, I wanted to uh, pick up one thing that you mentioned. Uh, you said we got 3% of the data. So I wanted to ask, I mean, in order to ultimately with 100% of the data to discover something, at some point this has to show up even at a small significance. So are there any signs of anything that deviates from the standard model, even if it's not at this point significant and you wouldn't publish it in the New York Times or anything like that? Well, you know, you can't ask me that question. <laughs> uh, well, I, I will say that um, there, that, you know- I'm not talking uh, about not, pu not public, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just not I mean, a discovery that's published. <laughs> right. There's, there's, I mean, there's like little, you know, two sigmas uh, here and there. Um, I don't think anything that consistently draws a, that draws a consistent picture, right? Because if you, if you see, um, you know, let's say a three sigma in, in one of the analysis, like that has implications in other analysis. And I think so far we don't really have something that's just consistently um, you know, showing signs of new physics uh, like that. I will say that for the for the top escorts or the the partners of the top, um, for for this, we are at the point where we have excluded um, what what the Phi Sigma discovery would have been at the Heisenberg CLHC. And and again, this is based on simplified models, right? You can have you can have stops in different ways. Um, but, but there, you know, for me, that's one of the reasons why I'm not continuing with this program for round three. I mean, I, I think it's important to do, um, and I'm, I'm sure someone else will do it. Um, but I think this is not going to be a big impact in the next few years. Uh, Gang, maybe? Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Indira. A very uh, nice talk. Uh, so high energy experiment, right, generates lots of uh, data, massive amount of data. And what is the prospect of using, using artificial intelligence and machine learning to find out more signals out of uh, these noisy, uh, massive amount of data? Is it possible to discover new particles that way? Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, my hope is that it is possible, but you know, it's. It, um, I, I I will tell you the direction that I'm going with this tool, and then you know, hopefully that will generate um, other things. But 
what I, what so this tool is now going to be adopted by the by the CMS collaboration, meaning that it's not going to be just used by the muon detectors, but also by the other part, you know, the the um, the other detectors, the colorimeters, the tracker, and so on. And what this tool requires is actually input from detector experts. So it can pick up anomalies, but then it's up to the detector expert to say these anomalies are from known detector issues. Like we understand why this plot is weird. It's because, you know, this chip failed for this run. Um, and then what I'm hoping comes out of that is that if there's anomalies that are not expected um, by, that are not explained by the detector failures. Um, and again, you know, you could just be collecting a bunch of trash with this tool, right? It could go really wrong. Um, but if there's anomalies that are, that, that we cannot explain with, with things that we know about the detectors and there's enough of, you know, a group of them, then this is the sort of information that we can feed into some special triggers that we have in CMS that have very low thresholds. Um, so, you know, it could be a success story, it could not, um, but it, by providing this tool to, to the collaboration, we allow for that sort of generation of thought to happen. Um, one thing that we are doing is that these algorithms are very, very good at detecting um, detector failures, which actually is a, a main background of some of these long-lived searches that I want to go after. So it might not be this tool that we, you know, it will not be this tool that we use for the analysis, but a lot of the expertise that we have gained from this tool. Sorry, there's a motorcycle outside my window. All right, I think David. Hi, <laughs> thanks. And I really enjoyed your talk. It's uh, so, so clear and uh, a nice way of talking about uh, CMS, uh, which I know a bit, uh, but it's nice to see it presented so well. Thank you. And I also liked uh, how you started in, in placing particle physics uh, uh, as with its connections to other areas. And uh, one of you just mentioned uh, the technology that's involved, uh, which is important for lots of scientific fields, uh, is something where the state of the art is, is being adopted and, and even extended uh, and particle physics experiments that, that are important just for uh, understanding of nature at you know, wide areas. But I also liked the uh, ideas that you started out with and also which uh, the presenting the astronomy or the, the, you know, there are observations at the large scale as you know, being motivating uh, and it, how important it was to understand some astrophysics um, and getting motivation from astrophysics uh, for the particle physics focus. And I think there's a really strong connection between the large scale and the small scale. And I was glad that you, you brought that out. So, and there, there are huge questions when you say we haven't found anything. Well, there's, <laughs> you know, most of the universe is out there to discover and we're, we're one of the places. Uh, so I say thank you for that too. Thank you. Minach. Yeah, in the, yeah. Could we go back to that triangle plot which you uh, showed up to Jay? And I just wanted to understand that another one of, right, if I understood it correctly, apart from moving from this black to red line, which was just adding more um, data, the full run two data set, going up to the green was because of using the uh, machine learning algorithms and specifically the, the neural network uh, taggers, right? Yeah. That is another Please. application of AI techniques, which yeah. uh, actually gave that huge uh, bump there. Yeah. I, My understanding it, it, is correct. Yeah, that is correct. I, that's part of it. The other part is also that we went to data-driven uh, background estimation mm -hmm. technique, uh, which the previous analysis did not. Do. So how much would that be? Like, uh, what part of that? Uh, probably about 100 GeV, maybe. OK. So uh, the larger is using machine learning. Um, yeah, because it, yeah, when you when we use the machine learning algorithms, um, basically we added extra bins to the search. Yeah. Um, so if you had some new particle, then your your sensitivity for finding that new particle increased. Yes, 
Absolutely. And I will say that this is something that the earlier analysis explored a little bit, um, but they were not uh, seeing as drastic results. Uh, part of it is because these, these uh, well, the current uh, deep neural networks that we have are very harsh, uh, you know, very harsh cuts. So you need a lot of data to be able to uh, make sure that you maintain uh, some of the signal expectation that you need for the, for the sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I see Chris has a lot of questions on the chat. Yeah, you want to tackle any of uh, them? You have been yeah, utilizing it. Let me maybe. Uh, do you see my results? So <laughs> it looks like we have some some people. Uh, so let me look at Chris's questions. Uh, okay. So let's say collect all parts of the animal. Okay, they might need some. Uh, Chris, do you want to just unmute? Yeah, it's pretty easy. You know, I'm okay. the uh, I'm the uh, kibitzer since I'm not a physicist. But uh, you know, what you're doing is you're collecting information. You have an experiment that generates information. It generates it at a prodigious rate. My understanding is that you can't even store it all. It's coming off so fast. Right. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, so that's a limitation, but that's a practical limitation as opposed to a, um, you know, a theoretic limitation. Uh, then there's the well, issue. It's, it's not really practical because it's, we're also pushing now the boundaries of compu the computational, right? It's, it's even if we... What's an outer bound of computational? I mean, I'm going to... So do you... Yeah, you, no, even if... That's a trick question. If, I don't want to be yeah. evil. No, 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 it's okay. Even if you had like infinite amount of money, right? And you could store all of this data. Um, you are, then after you store the data, you have to process it. We have to reconstruct it, make sure that we categorize all the particles where we need to go and so on. And then, and then after you do that, then you have to, um, the analyzer, like me, has to take a look at the data, device my, uh, my uh, analysis and so on. Why and do you have to be in the loop? Why, because I'm the brain. <laughs> Oh. Right? I guess I, I'm the one that puts it all together at the end, right? Even wow. if I want to do a machine learning algorithm, I have to feed my knowledge of physics to that machine learning algorithm. Uh, there, was so, a guy, Indira, there was a guy, um, you know, a while back, and I don't know what happened to this, but I know that NSF, DARPA, a bunch of people have been worried about uh, discovering physics, essentially, mm -hmm. and doing it uh, with uh, machine learning or something like that. But Hads was the most uh, appealing to me because it was kind of a de novo approach de novo approach mm -hmm. so i'm really asking a fundamental theoretical question uh mm -hmm. that you know there's, there's the practicalities but mm -hmm. uh, you know you say there's computational uh difficulties well i need a number in terms of the number of flops or something like that and then that boundary can get pushed out as we do better at computation so really what i'm asking is whether folks have looked at this thing from a holistic standpoint what are the outer bounds of the computation period uh, for example, there could be, it could be that the interactions are so complex that, you know, we're talking about 10 to the 2000th um, computations, which is just inconceivable, except maybe, you know, if, um, uh, you know, uh, Vesna's here and Vesna's successful, you know, we have quantum whatevers. So I, I guess that what I'm asking is how do people think about the general problem and are they constrained by the machinery? Or is it, or, or are there theoretical realms that we could imagine exploring, taking humans out of the loop, perhaps? So this is, you know, again, I'm a non-specialist. So well, just like, uh, uh, just like Jay said, you know, I'm dangerous. You know, I'm just dangerous enough to hurt myself. But th that's really what I'm asking. What are the outer bounds? Yeah. So I, I mean, like I said, for com I don't quite remember all the numbers for for the computational uh, restrictions. But I mean, we have so much data that we're collecting that if we wanted to just process it all, it would it would take an immense amount of time. We would never be able to produce science at the speed that we do. And Can you I don't. I, a little bit. I'm what, sorry. What, what's what's never? How big is never? Um, I, I, I years. don't know the, the years, I would years. say probably, yes. I, I mean, it takes us even with the, even with the way that we do data now. And I, I, I actually want to go back even before that, right? It's not, it's like when you're going through, you know, you're analyzing some data, you don't want to analyze data that doesn't make sense for what you're looking for. 
And so, you know, even I think the trigger and in, in it, it doesn't just play like a practical um, role, but it also plays an important physics role because you want to make sure that you focus on the data that has potential to have new physics in it. That's um, the point and, of the data space. So yeah, so that's, that's something that, that can be inferred. Right, by, and then if you, and then now when we think about the way where we're going with the high luminosity LHC, um, then it's both, it, it's again, limitations with storage. We cannot possibly store all of the data that, that, we, that we collect. Um, because even, even well, even the way that we store the data that we do that that we that passes the trigger, um, we we have many data formats for it. And what makes it to the analyzer is a very compressed data format. And so the analyzer either has to be able to do their anal analysis or their searches with that data format, or they have to go back to request um, you know data formats that have more information, which are stored on disk. And you know that just again delays yeah, the these whole are process. I, I, these are practical things. As an information theorist, uh, when you said compressed, you're throwing away information, and then I'm going to stop because you know. Yeah, I, yeah, we're I'm throwing a yeah. So we we're you are only storing the very very high level information. Um, so like, what is a muon? You know, we're not storing the actual energy deposits. Um, so that's what that's what most analyzers see. Um, and, and so we've, we've done this, we've gone to this route because when we collect these massive amounts of data at the high luminosity LHC, we're not gonna be able to have the, computer pro the computing processing power to actually analyze um, you know, all of the different, uh, um, all of the different information that is available on the tape, on, on, data, that, on data that is stored on tape. And so, you know, it's, it's, I, I think that for, maybe you think of it as a practical uh, problem. I, I think of it as a, a very fundamental problem because if it's going to take me years to analyze all of this data, I, I already have to wait years to collect it all, right? That's given and, a particular type of computation though. So if you can measure it in terms of actual computation and the speed per computation, that's mm -hmm. really what I'm after because uh, there are things that you can do now that you couldn't even dream of doing in 1980 when I was in graduate school. Mm -hmm. So that's really what I'm asking. Yeah. And the last um, thing, you, by the way, do pe and this is for everybody, do people look at what's coming in? Greg kind of asked this question vaguely uh, for me. Um, do people look at what's coming, what's bathing Earth? Because you know, the universe is a big collider. And I know that's not you, mm -hmm. but I'm just curious. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of uh, a, a lot of um, uh, a lot of um, you know uh, cosmologists. Sorry, I was reading some message. A lot of cosmologists are you know looking into. Um, I mean, the universe is kind of like a you know different experiment, and so there's definitely a lot of advances happening there that I think are going to help us and drive the, uh, you know continue driving the search for new physics. Yeah, I want to blank myself because I've just flapped my lips. So bye. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, but Chris, this is a good future collaboration, and uh, maybe. Oh, you know, I'm always looking with for that. places to, to apply my trade. Minakshi, you know me already. Yes, so. definitely. Yeah, I, I must admit, computing is my new area for me. So you know, a lot of the numbers are still uh, not there, uh, but I can certainly follow up. <laughs> All right, thanks, Chris. Okay. So I think uh, we have. Uh, had a very uh, interesting discussion. And so unless there is any urgent question at this point of time, I don't see any other hand raised. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Indara for giving this special colloquium and, uh, and a very, very nice presentation, which as we heard was appreciated by many. So thank you very much. And thanks everyone for attending this and making this. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, it was nice to meet a lot of you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye.